money is attractive to most people, right? But I guess the real avatar that I'm looking for is someone that has the ambition, um, has gone through something that most entrepreneurs have, like a trauma, something that switches their mind to want to achieve something bigger than they've ever achieved before. My brain never switches off. I dream about videos sometimes. That's how addicted I am to this. There's a very low chance that you'll make it that far if you don't get addicted to an end goal. I'm a big believer in quality over quantity. There's guys that post every single day, but they get like 2000 views a video, right? But then I'll post once a month and make sure that I'm focusing all of my energy on studying the competition, writing down as many ideas as possible, comparing my ideas to other viral videos, and then I post that one video and it gets a thousand X of the, what those people got in one video. All right, all right. We have Tony here on the podcast, also known as Toozer, which how'd you, how'd you come up with Toozer, by the way? It's just an old nickname, actually, from my last name, it's Matusiak. So the boys back home in the lacrosse team, they just shortened it to Toozer. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, if you guys don't know, Tony Tuzer, whatever you want to call him, he's absolutely crushing it. He's in the e-com game, and your TikToks are just everywhere. I'm sure anyone who's in the the e-com space has seen your TikToks. But would love to dive in and kind of figure out like how you got your start. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if everyone's seen my TikToks yet. I mean, they're starting to get all over the place now. Um, I have a few accounts, multiple platforms now, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess to start out from when I first started business in general, I guess, right? I didn't start TikTok and my my personal brand until, um, I guess, three years into business. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll just jump back to where I get st got started. Um, high school, um, I wasn't really one of those guys that was like selling candy in the hallways and stuff like that. I feel like a lot of people tell that story all the time. Is that an aid stand, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was kind of entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, sorry, entrepreneurial. Um, I just didn't really know what entrepreneur was back then, but I always had that kind of mindset. Um, but back then, I had a little couple side hustles like detailing cars, um, landscaping, um, and even like farther back up until elementary school. Man, Yu-Gi-Oh cards back in the day. That was my probably my first entrepreneurial thing. Dude, um, same. Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Yu-Gi-Oh yeah. cards in high school for me. Yeah, my biggest like. Like it blew my mind. I've, I'll never forget this. I uh, I'm from the or I'm half Filipino, so I went to the Philippines when I was really young. Um, and uh, when I was there, I actually got an Egyptian god card. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but it's like a rare card back in the day. I brought it back to my elementary school in Canada, and I traded it for a thousand cards. So I was like, damn, you know, <laughs> that's uh, that's leverage right there, and I, I that stuck to me uh, up until now. But moving forward up until university. Um, I kind of really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I mean, I was kind of forced into doing it. Um, I was a lacrosse player, so I got a scholarship. I went to a s pretty shitty school in, in the States. I wasn't the best student, so I just kind of pulled the trigger on this one school. And when I was down there, I was like, man, I'm just surviving off of, you know, um, like the, the scholarship money and, you know, endless cafeteria, stuff like that. But I didn't have like real money to spend and go do stuff and go visit the city you know, go out, um, obviously booze money back in university is something that's popular. Yep. So I started searching around. I was like, how do I make money while I'm in school? Um, so I, you know, I started looking up on Google ways I can make money. Obviously me not having a visa, I'm outside of the country. I can't get a job. So that's out the window. So I was like, all right, how do I sell something? Um, I've ex I had experience with like selling stuff on Facebook marketplace and Craigslist be uh, before. So I was like, uh, just type in how to make money and the first like when it pops up you know the suggestions was how to make money online so i clicked on that and that's where everything kind of exploded i went down the rabbit hole um went from business to business and uh yeah from there i kind of uh just went all in you know yep i figure everyone has that rabbit hole story you know where you have these 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 points in your life where you're doing stuff, right? For you, it was like detailing cars, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you name it. And eventually it comes up to that one moment where you kind of just, you get, the, it's the epiphany, right? Everyone has that moment. So for you, it was basically going down this this make money online rabbit hole. Exactly. And I don't even think that was like the main like switch where it really like hit me that this is something that's feasible, you know? I mean, I would say I was kind of lucky, you know, playing sports, 
Um, I was able to travel some places and see, you know, like higher net worth families and stuff like that. Um, you know, different cities and seeing different neighborhoods. So that kind of opened my mind a bit. I feel like a lot of people that get stuck in a small town or stuck back home, they never leave. They don't really know what's out there to accomplish. So that kind of helped me. And I mean, just like everybody, you know, like you got to be grateful for the events that you go through because they all just prime you to become the person that you are today. So I would consider that part of my life lucky. Um, but from there, I used all of that as leverage to, you know, go in all in on business. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have a similar story to that. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what was your big segue into e-commerce? Yeah. So that time that I searched up on Google, how to make money and then went down the online money uh, rabbit hole. Um, the first business model I actually went after was affiliate marketing. So if you don't know what affiliate marketing is, you're basically advertising other businesses for a commission. Um, and the hard part with that was it's kind of limited to, you know, their type of content, their marketing, their funnel. So me not having that much experience, I spent a bunch of money on my credit card advertising with no return. Um, I was like, I think the first product was like a dog food subscription or something. And uh, I was like, man, this is too difficult. Next one was Amazon FBA because that kind of made sense to me right away. Um, you just obviously just list stuff on Amazon, similar to, I guess, my experience with Facebook Marketplace and uh, not Kijiji, Craigslist. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to list some products on there. Little did I know, you need a few thousand dollars to buy inventory just to test a product and it might not even sell, right? So quickly I learned that's not really for me either. Um, so I kind of like took a step back. I was like, holy fuck, this is crazy. I don't know if I can actually do this. I'm going to stick to school and you know, become a doctor like my immigrant parents want me to do. Yep. Um, and then it was like a few weeks later, I got an ad on, the face on Facebook and it was this guy kind of explaining like how simple e-commerce is specifically drop shipping and drop shipping obviously you can start with no inventory right whenever you get an order all you have to do is purchase the product from a supplier and send it directly to the customer's address so no upfront cost and you know you have access to almost every single product from china so you can mold to something that you actually understand and sell and you know you can you know make any ads that you want your own website, all of this stuff. So it's all malleable to your own advantage. So all of that just clicked for me. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to go all in on this. Nice. So drop shipping was, was drop shipping was the first way. And then, you know, that's just an entry point. Um, drop shipping is a way to start a business instantly, almost with very low, uh, upfront capital. And then from there, obviously, once you build momentum, you want to level up, right? There's different phases of your business. Um, I happened to brand my first, uh, Shopify store. For, from drop shipping to private labeling. Um, and then, you know, things took off from there. So nice, nice. And so I guess, how old were you at this time? Uh, I was, tw I was 20 when I had my first like real success. Um, and I had like little small online businesses before that. Nice. But you don't have any marketing background or anything. No, I mean, I was always kind of like interested in like, I guess, influencers and social media and like, you know, YouTube, I was watching YouTube a lot. Um, so I guess I always had like an attention to detail with, you know, the way people act, um, you know, putting myself in, I guess, the consumer's shoes. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't take marketing in school, so. Yeah. And I, th I think that just shows like, if you're willing to just learn and figure it out, you're gonna, it just takes time, right? Like, yeah everyone's story it's 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 never like i mean maybe you get lucky and someone you know gets gets it right the first try but you have to try affiliate marketing you have to try um what, what was it before your drop shipping fba amazon fba, amazon FBA yeah then drop shipping right and it's just you just gotta be willing to learn for a lot of this stuff to make money online yeah i think the most difficult part that people don't figure out is how to be obsessed with an end goal you know um, people don't attach a goal to the actual tasks that they're going to do. So they all quit, right? They can't like be addicted to what they want to achieve. And I think that's something that I really wanted to do. Um, I think like myself forcing myself to do these businesses and burn a lot of money. Like I didn't have any money at this point. I had just a credit card and I was just stacking credit card debt. So I was like, 
I literally have to make this work or else I'm in trouble. Um, so like that kind of shifted me to actually get addicted to making it work. Yeah. It's, it's, it's do or die basically for you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs or, you know, I guess just successful people in general, like they all have that one like trauma phase, right. That makes them switch and turn into an absolute demon, you know? I agree. You you need to go through it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what separates a real entrepreneur from someone who's not is what do you do in, in those times where your back's against a wall, nothing's working. And in 99.9% .9 of cases, the best thing to do is just to give up. So exactly, exactly. People don't realize like it's simple, not easy. I say this all the time because you know, the process is really simple. You can go down the street, see a business, dissect exactly what they're doing. And nowadays, especially with AI and all these tools that we have access to, you can actually see the revenue from a business. You can actually see their marketing everywhere instantly, right? So the process is simple. All you have to do is do exactly what that successful business is doing. The hard part that makes it, you know, obviously not easy is the emotion and, you know, being tough. Um, that's something that, you know, 99% of people can't have, or they just don't have. Yeah. It's, it's resilience. Exactly. So I think the faster, if you're watching this, the faster you can build resilience in life, the better it is going to be for you, no matter what challenges you tackle, because you're, nothing is just a, it's not roses and, and daisies and all that all the time. It's, you're going to get hit in the face one time, two times, three times, nonstop, honestly. And sometimes it's, it lasts a long, long time. Oh yeah, man. Comfort's out the fucking window. Yeah. So that's good to see. So I guess, how did you go from drop shipping to starting to make content online? What was that big? Okay. Yeah. So I did the whole e-commerce thing, you know, I still do it. And I mean, I'm going to explain more of how I've transitioned to kind of a bigger picture of what I did before. Um, but I did it for around three years before I actually started, um, my TikTok. Um, and what happened was, you know, I was using TikTok a lot for my e-commerce businesses. Um, the organic reach was crazy. The TikTok ads were super cheap. Um, so, you know, I was able to scale a lot of stores really high, really fast on there, especially there's not really any regulations in the beginning. Um, and I was so caught up in those e-commerce stores with that marketing, um, that I didn't really like look at you know, becoming a, a personal brand with that leverage. Um, until I started watching, you know, more and more content on TikTok, like actually consuming it myself, um, I started to get targeted with entrepreneurial content. And I started to realize, damn, like I really don't want to be a guru. Um, obviously I have the knowledge to help people, but I don't want to be, you know, a guru. Um, so I saw all these people and they're all so like salesy, you know, they're like, trying to sell you a course right away, like shoving it down your throat. And a lot of them don't even know what you're talking about, especially someone that has experience. Like I can call bullshit on almost all of these guys. Right. So I was like, you know what? I don't want to be a guru, but I still want to see the leverage, um, and see like where I can take this. Um, so I'm just going to post a video of my actual business, actual results show, what people don't believe in, you know, insane profit for a young kid. Um, from online, you know, and it's almost instant uh, for the, with this business model. And the first video, uh, I think it got like, like five figures of views. It was like maybe like 30,000 or something, but that was enough confidence for me to, you know, make the next video. And I posted another one that's, you know, based off of the data from the first video. Oh, maybe I should do a different hook, um, make it a little bit shorter, Te keep on testing, keep on posting. And eventually first month I got to 150,000 followers or something like that on my first TikTok account. And then I was like, you know what, maybe I will use this to my advantage and, you know, come up with an idea that, um, I can actually use this for the better rather than, you know, doing the typical, I'm going to sell a course right away. Um, uh, maybe I can build a company that will actually build value and gain the attention from my personal brand to start with. So that's how I first started. Nice. And I think that's, that's so underrated what you just said, which is everybody nowadays gurus, you know, people selling stuff, they just want to take, 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 right. Versus you kind of flip that model around and said, I'm just going to give value, give value, give value. And, and you know, if you give enough value online, people will be figuring out ways how to buy stuff from you. 
Exactly. I mean, there's always two sides to a transaction, right? Um, you can't just sell nothing, right? I mean, they're obviously selling something, but most of the time it doesn't produce results, which doesn't produce value. And without value, you can't create, you know, successful business owners that inject more, um, you know, movement into the economy, right? So whenever you start a business, it has to be something that helps the economy. Otherwise, it's not going to last. So I guess when you were making this TikTok content, right? Obviously, you don't have any script writing skills or any experience writing hooks and, and even just knowing what works. How did you go about thinking about like, hey, how do I structure and, and write TikToks? Like, how do I even come up with ideas? And you know, what do people want to hear? Yeah, so I mean, I would just put myself in like an isolated you know, environment. I mean, I would always be in an isolated environment anyway, working at home, right? Um, running an online business is like that. So I would just, you know, watch TikToks, get some ins inspiration from not even like this space. I would actually get a lot of inspiration from like the fitness space and because it's a lot more developed than the entrepreneurial, sorry, the entrepreneurial space. Um, so I'd get inspiration from their hooks, you know, what makes those videos go more viral. Um, obviously it's the same where it's in personal development. So I'd look at those type of videos as well. And then, you know, I would just put myself into the, the consumer uh, consumer's shoes and just keep on saying stuff back to me and just listening to it. So I'd say a hook, listen to it back. And then I would film it and keep on refilming it until, you know, I see something that has that little edge compared to the other hooks, right? And then I'd film the next part and then film the next part. So I didn't really start out scripting. I just started out by like, it's like playing a guitar and listening to what you're playing, right? Um, and then uh, lighting got involved as well. So then I was like, oh, this video is probably not performing. Let's try a really nice ring light. And that actually boosted the videos like crazy. So it was all just about testing. And then, you know, once I got better, I like to really plan out videos now and make sure that they're super valuable, as easy to understand as possible, um, and really follow the framework that I built. And yeah, now I do script a little bit, but still when I'm reading a script, I'm always listening to myself and making sure that's something that I would want to hear myself. Nice. And are you filming I guess a few times before you get to that final product? Um, yeah, well, like I said, when I'm listening to myself, if it's something that doesn't come back the way I want it to be, I will refilm it until it happens, so. Nice. Yeah, and I see your content now, it's it's probably evolved a lot from the early days, you were just using your business as the example to provide value, but now I, I believe you just take you're able to leverage other people's companies and unique trends going on to really incorporate into your hooks and, and your topics. Exactly. I mean, the main focus for my content, I guess my informational content, um, the lifestyle content is kind of on hold right now, but the informational side, I just want to make it as simple as possible for the average person to understand because, you know, business really is simple. Just like I said before, um, you know, I just want to break down a business that everybody knows and make them really believe that they can actually do it themselves, especially now, you know, as the economy evolves, as we move forward and everything grows, you know, in the consumer side, you know, we ride a wave of convenience, but at the same time with business, we are riding a wave of convenience to build businesses as well, right? We have way more resources than we used to have. We have the internet and in the internet, we have tools, especially with AI now. So through my videos, I just want to show people that they can literally do the same thing that, you know, a hundred years ago when businesses started to build on the side of the road, you can do that same method, but by finding something on the internet, breaking it down and starting it instantly with, you know, the tools and AI that we have now. Absolutely. So who would you define as like your target person you're talking to? Like if you had to just describe your, your avatar. You know what? I mean, I think money is uh you know attractive to most people right but i guess the real avatar that i'm looking for is someone that has the ambition um has gone through something that most entrepreneurs have like a trauma something that s switches their mind to want to achieve something bigger than they've ever achieved before um, because those are the people i want to attract into obviously uh, my company which is building more founders um, and then building people within those founded companies as well Yep, and that's that's the main company you have today. Exactly, the main company, um, but it's made up of, of multiple different parts. Obviously, it's under construction. Every business is always under construction. 
Um, but what this company is, is basically to create founders, make sure that they have all the resources. Um, and we're going to be moving into as well, creating, you know, entrepreneurs as well. So there's entrepreneurs, which are usually the founders. And then there's the entrepreneurs of the business where they help those businesses scale. So as those two, you know, sides of people in the business are created through our company, uh, we're moving into um, actually an AI software that connects those people to scale businesses instantly with AI. All right, said AI twice there, but yeah, it's that good. AI. Nice. <laughs> so that that's that's a, the other thing you're building outside is is uh is the AI side. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So obviously, like this is the first you know part of the roadmap, um, but these people and their businesses are going to need to obviously scale in the future. And, you know, every single business, especially e-commerce, it's so easy to just see the data and see what's missing in these businesses and then instantly take action on, you know, it's missing this. We can instantly add this, you know, it's missing, you know, this advertisement, this, it's missing this acquisition funnel. It's missing this app or software, you know, it's missing all these things instantly. The people that we've created to, you know, create these resources, or act as these resources or these softwares are instantly taken on to these businesses and scaled. Nice. And so what's uh what's your game plan in terms of like where you see yourself making content? Do you want to make more long form content? Obviously, you know, I know you're gonna keep doing short form content, but Yeah, it's actually funny that you asked that. And I mean, I thought you were also gonna ask if I, you know, take podcasts often. I don't. Um, and the reason is, is, you know, I don't really believe that podcasts are the most effective form of content for, you know, someone that does has minimal time, right? So I tend to focus mainly on short form right now because it's what takes the least time and has the most leverage of media, right? You can really curate a piece of content based off of data um, and, you know, refilm it, make sure that it's perfect and then put it out. And in that hour that usually a podcast would take, um, you might get, you know, two or three clips that have potential to go viral. But in that same hour, I can film, you know, 10 to 20 uh, viral videos, right? Because they're based off of data. It's not just off the rip. So that's where I'm really focusing on. The next thing that I'm focusing on, I guess, in the next two to six weeks, I don't know, it's hard to kind of see where everything's going. It's busy. But Long form is definitely the next thing for sure. Yeah. So on the topic of time, you mentioned, right? You're obviously very busy with you know, growing your businesses. I'm, I'm assuming that's where most of your time is. What would you, what advice would you give someone watching this who's in that same boat, right? Where they, they only have a limited amount of time and they want to make short form content, but make it well. How much time is that a week? And like, how would you kind of, put your, your framework for them. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, I'm going to recommend a book. This will help that, that person right away. Um, this is a really underrated book. I feel like people overlook it because it's such a simple concept, but it's called the one thing. I forget who it's by, but that one book, I read it. I actually took action on the steps in that book, changed my life. And then I slowly started to believe, unbelieve that, right. All people around me, you know, I'm always networking with other entrepreneurs, you know, other people that are in the space and everyone's always like, oh, we got to do that next thing. We got to do this next thing. And there's opportunities everywhere, especially once you gain skills in this business or, you know, in business in general, you know, the horizon expands so fast and all of a sudden there's everything that you could do and there's other people hitting you up. Let's start this business. Let's invest in this. So that book basically describes that you need to focus on literally one thing. If you don't focus on one thing, you will sp spread yourself thin and you will fall apart every single time. No matter what, you will never achieve as much um, on two things as one thing, right? You're just split in half. And I mean, a lot of people say diversify your investments and stuff like that. I also disagree on that, right? Um, just to put it into more of a visual, you know, when you invest into something like the S&P 500, obviously you're, you know, a trading guy. The money is made from compounding, right? You invest a certain amount every single month and over time that 10% is going to compound. Every single year is going to compound, right? The same thing is with time. If you focus on one task, let's say you're, um, you know, creating content, 
If you focus on that one task and then you complete that task, what are you going to do with that extra time? You're going to compound it back into the same thing or you're going to compound or you're going to take that extra time and put it into something else that's starting from zero, you know? So it's the same thing as an investment. It's an investment of time. Nice. And and that's what you've, you've really seen that, that compounded growth on your short form really take off. Exactly. It's every single time I apply this concept, I just compound my time into the most valuable thing. Um, everything just explodes. Um, and it's really hard for people to also just realize like what they need to prioritize. Prioritize prioritization is key. Yeah. And so you've been putting out short form content consistently over the past two years. Is that like one TikTok a day or, or how many of you, how many have you done? Yeah. So it fluctuates. Um, I mean, I started, um, like Q1 of last year. And since then I was kind of on and off, like I would, you know, have a huge spurt. Um, and then I would kind of stop because I'd get busy with another business model and stuff like that. Right. I'm always still working on other stuff in the back. Like this is just a front. Right. Um, but, and then halfway through the year, I kind of learned more about leverage of short form. So I'd expand to multiple editors, multiple accounts, actually. I mean, a lot of people know Andrew Tate, how he did that. And then I would grow even higher. And then that would give me more time to work on my business. So I'd back off again. Um, but not until this year, I really realized that this is something that I want to wrap all of my time around. And in order to get there, I had to build a team, which is very difficult. I'm sure you know, man. Yeah. Uh, finding good people is nearly impossible. Um, but luckily, we have finally happened to you know grow the team to a certain size that we can actually... Um, you know, have the momentum that doesn't stop. And, you know, we have enough people to go through people, fire people, bring more people on, um, which frees up my time to focus on something that drives that whole business. So nice, nice. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you said that you you really started to take it seriously this year. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of compounded growth on what you really focused. 100%. Yeah. So I guess in the beginning of this year, I would post, I think I was like posting two, maybe three videos a week. So obviously that's pretty low. Most people post like multiple times a day. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in quality over quantity, especially now with the, you know, short form and how viral things can go. You obviously will, you know, there's, there's guys that post every single day, but they get like 2000 views a video. Right. But then I'll post once a month and make sure that I'm, focusing all of my energy on studying the competition, writing down as many ideas as possible, comparing my ideas to other viral videos. And then I post that one video and it gets a thousand X of the, what those people got in one video, you know? So quality over quantity for sure. Yeah. And it sounds like you're constantly just researching competitors and studying and testing as well, which I think is so underrated. Exactly. Like my brain never switches off. I dream about videos sometimes. That's how addicted I am to this. Um, but like I said before, there's a very low chance that you'll make it that far if you don't get addicted to an end goal. And, you know, right now my end goal is content. Obviously the monetary stuff is, you know, behind all this stuff. Um, but it's, it's bigger than that now. You know, I'm sure we're on, you know, similar terms with, you know, where business is at nowadays. Money really becomes invaluable. Uh, with lifestyle stuff when you reach a certain point so once you get to that point you know you need a different end goal than you know accumulating as much money as possible to spend you know with the club and stuff like that it shifts to making as much money as possible but to build something as big as possible right um just like we talked about compounding time compounding money back into the same investment yeah it's a it's an interesting stage as an entrepreneur because it's it's almost a different stage of money in the beginning when you have none right maybe you'll maybe you learn a skill where you make six figures maybe you start a business when you have nothing but in the early days when you have no money you make money for yourself right it's for yeah. selfish reasons once you get to a certain point where you have money coming for yourself the next thing is to basically help your team make money people in the company right make sure they're incentivized make yeah. sure they're they're down to grow and i think once you have that stabilized, then it's really how big can you grow something and make the biggest impact and help as many people in the world as possible. Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, my team has grown to, I think we're at around 75-ish people right now. 
Um, and it's just growing every day. Obviously, it's really difficult to find good people. So, um, you know, a lot of these people might leave, you know, some people might be added, right? But we're constantly growing. And all of those people, you know, a lot of people mention this in podcasts, right? Some people with big companies and they get all of this anxiety and like pressure on their shoulders because all of these people actually depend on you as, you know, the sole owner of the company, right? If the company's not making money, those people don't eat, right? So it's kind of a scary thought to have in the back of your head, but it also is very motivating. It is. It's a double-edged sword. So when things are good, they're good. But I swear in business, when it's when it's bad, it pours. Exactly. Exactly. And another thing as well, just to touch on, you know, people in a business, I think a lot of guys nowadays, they kind of overlook, um, I guess, the the two sides of value again, right? Even within their the people working for them, right? A lot of people just don't treat people properly. They think they're like, you know, slaves in your company and stuff like that. If the people in your company enjoy what they're doing and they're good, they are good at it and they're making, you know, what they deserve, it's just going to excel your business so much farther. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a big believer in just having the right incentive structures for people who have, especially for people who are talented or have shown that like they want to be there and they want to grow and they're passionate about the, the culture and the vision. Exactly. Exactly. So I guess how, uh, how has it been growing your business to that size? Obviously you're, you're in the, you're in the stage where you need to have more infrastructure. How, uh, I guess, how have you learned the different phases of business from, you know, from day zero till now? Yeah. So obviously it changes a lot, just like we just mentioned, money changes a lot. Um, before it's a really dangerous thing to, you know, use all of the mo the money from the business for yourself. Um, I actually ran into that problem a few times with my first businesses, you know, even especially my first e-commerce business, that was the first actual good money that I ever made, especially as a young guy. Um, so I spent a lot of that on myself and I wasn't able to reinvest that into growing the business further. Like what, by the way, what's, uh, what's, what are some, oh man, downward, downward purchases, but I guess like as well. just taking, taking the boys out and paying for a lot of drinks and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> booze is not cheap. I mean, it's not in Canada. Down here, it's a little cheaper. You can get like a 24 case for like 12 bucks. It's crazy. But um, yeah, I mean, money just goes down the drain, especially when you're pissing it down the urinal. Yep. <laughs> yep. You know, but um, yeah, I mean, the shift mainly came to, you know, using money w more wisely, you know, obviously live below your means, right? Reinvest into people, especially if they're so, so hard to find. Um, and then... I mean, on the management side with all of these people, I mean, it's not as scary as you would think. I honestly think a business is more bulletproof when there's more people. It sounds like more things could go wrong, but in my opinion, less things can go wrong. There's way more momentum, right? There's way more surface area of people. So, you know, if somebody, you know, doesn't show up to work, the other person is still there, right? Um, so it's just, it's just a matter of more of the same thing that's already working. So the biggest thing that I would suggest someone that's going into this phase of their business is to just really spend all of your time to identify the most valuable pillars in your business, you know, whether it's sales, whether it's marketing, um, and really develop those areas before you scale. Then once you want to scale, it's just literally more of the same thing. So just inject more cash into those, you know, buy more resources to, you know, double and triple the amount of people in there. Um, and then also with advertising, just find out what's working, you know, just repeat that, keep on learning and just inject more money into it. So just got to identify what's working and just do what more of the same thing. Yeah. I got some flashbacks when you were talking about, uh, the early days of business, because if you can, it's almost like the valley of death because in the early days, yes, you can operate lean, but there's a phase in between the early days where you're trying to go from lean and profitable to this next stage of, of business. Yep. And it's brutal because you end up hiring the wrong people. You're almost like doing double work. It's stressful and your profits go down. So you're making less money trying to scale. Yeah. And it's like what you said, it's, it's the valley of death. And I think that's where most entrepreneurs run into. I would say that's probably. It's like a minefield. Yeah. It's probably going from like seven or multi seven figures to eight figures. Exactly. That's, that's the big jump. Exactly. And actually, um, 
not too long ago, I went through a really big hurdle and that was kind of like my first real big sprint of hiring people because, you know, business was doing good. You know, I was like, the next level is to hire a bunch of people. You know, I want everything to be delegated. But the hard thing was like, you know, I took a little bit of business in the university. I took business for two years until I started my own business and dropped out. Um, if I had the time, I would probably go for an MBA because I do see the value in that stuff. A lot of people put shame on school. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that I did not know and costed me way more than probably the actual schooling would cost. Um, but my biggest mistake was just not knowing how to compensate with people, you know, not knowing how to structure the deal with them so that it doesn't fuck me over in the end. Um, you know, and just like hiring so many people that I actually don't need. And then once you accumulate all of these people, you know, you have this massive overhead and you have to make that every single month to pay for these people. And if you don't, you know, all these people are gone. You make a bad, bad rep for your company or your name and all these things. So that was very tough, especially um, with no experience and, you know, no experience building a hierarchy to help me manage those people on top of it. So that was the biggest thing that um, kind of pushed me into going into like double digits of um, staff members. Yep. 100% man. The valley of death. If you can make it, your life does become easier, I'd say. Oh yeah. It's got to push through, man. Quitting, yeah. quitting is not an answer. So I guess outside of business, where do you, where do you spend most of your time right now in terms of like generating creative ideas? How do you, uh, how do you constantly just come up with ideas for, for content? Yeah. So I think this is something that I always kind of fall in and out of and I hate it, but I th I'm going to try and keep myself straight on this belief uh, from now on forward because whenever I go into like a monk mode, you know, this is a popular term nowadays, um, you kind of isolate yourself to the point where you don't even talk to people. You don't even go out for dinner. You know, you're just like, I got to grind. I got to finish this. I got to get to the goal right away. Right. And that is super detrimental to creativity because creativity is all based off of reference. Um, a lot of people forget this. And I think this is a lot why a lot of people struggle with content is because they forget that, you know, no idea or no art, nothing created is invented. You know, nothing is one off. Everything is always reference, right? And something that a good, that makes a good creative person versus a bad creative person is the bad creative person just copies from one piece of content, right? The good creative person copies from a thousand pieces of content, right? They have a huge bank of uh, events, um, you know, emotions, you know, scenes in movies, things that they heard in a song, all of these things. And they, they can put all these things together like a puzzle and put into one piece of content, removing all, remove, <clears throat> sorry, removing all the bad parts and keeping all of the good parts. And that's what keep, uh, makes things go, you know, crazy on, online. Yeah. And it's so that's so underrated because people think, especially if you're in a creative role, like marketing, you name it. Like right now, a lot of my role is creative and literally I can watch a movie, listen to a song, go out, talk to friends at dinner. And like, that's where I get. Exactly. They just click. Yeah. You know, I've, I've come in close to thousands of ideas of videos, um, uh, moving forward. Obviously not all of them are I'm going to use in the future. Cause I'm going to come up with better ones, but you know, it, it really feels like um, I'm almost wasting time too when I'm doing that stuff because like I really need to do that. I need to watch YouTube videos. I need to watch movies. I need to go traveling, all these things to keep my creativity moving. Um, but it feels like I'm not being productive at the same time. So I want to quit doing that, go and hop onto meetings again, you know, help the, you know, the team members. Um, but it's really not what drives the needle. So that's something that I struggle with in my opinion. Nice. Yeah, how I overcame that is in, in I'd say the early days of business, it's definitely fine. Like monk mode is good. You have so much stuff to learn. It's like a fire hose of information. It's fine to go monk mode and just work 100 hours a week, learn everything, everything's chaos. I say that's like the first two to three years of business. After that, and recently for me, this was after I built out a leadership team, there's processes, infrastructure. Like my mornings are so key for me because to the outside, anyone looking in, it's like, oh, he doesn't, he used to wake up at, I used to wake up at 4.45 AM for two years straight. Yeah. And now I'll wake up at eight, maybe 9 AM. 
I will kind of just sit there. Sometimes I'll just sit on the couch, look at look at my phone, whatever it is. And then I have a, a workout late in my morning after my workout. I'll do a cold plunge and sauna. Granted, I didn't do any of this before, but I really just take my time in my mornings. And what people don't know is during all of that, my brain is still pumping. Oh, yeah. Like I'm thinking about ideas. I'm thinking about potential issues. I'm thinking about a new ad idea or, or maybe it's a new content idea. You name it. But my brain is just ripping. But unless you're a creative person that has, you need you need dead time. That's what it is. Like your calorie needs to be free and you kind of have to be dilly-dallying. Exactly. You need brain space. Um, getting too caught up in like individual, you know, tedious tasks, it just, you know, it ruins everything for yeah. your thinking. And, you know, even talking about what we talked about earlier with, you know, the shift, the shift for us really transformed into, you know, one good decision a day rather than a bunch of tiny, you know, really, I guess, less valuable tasks and decisions, right? So actually, I really love what Jeff Bezos said. It's it's some, some clip, um, but he says that his biggest task every single day is to get eight hours of sleep because everything depends off his decisions. I agree. I'm I'm sleeping eight hours and it's great. And you sleep too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I need to sleep like nine hours is like optimal. Like today I slept in, I didn't, no alarm, nothing. And you know, you just wake up and you just feel like everything's vibrant, you know? I agree. It's sleeping is the the number one thing. Like you don't need a cold plunge. You don't need all this crazy stuff. In the early days of business, when I had nothing, I literally woke up, made sure I got eight hours of sleep, had a coffee in the morning. That was it. That's the morning routine. Yeah. And I mean, all of the areas of health, you know, they all play a part, right? You can't sleep good if you don't eat good or if you don't exercise, but you can't exercise and you don't want to eat good if you don't sleep good. Right, it's that that trio that's constantly cycling. You got to have all of those things dialed. Um, but yeah, I would say my new monk mode is you know five days a week, and then the weekend is just you know go time. Yeah, go time, enjoy, have fun. Exactly. That's when the brain expands is on the weekend. Yeah, and even just changing your environment. Like I was just in Europe for two yep. weeks, and I got so much, so much creative ideas being over there. And, and clarity that sometimes when you wake up in your day to day, you, you underestimate how much, how much a, a vacation can really reset your, your mind. It is crazy. You know, like you really don't realize until you're there and I get caught up. I know a lot of people deal with this as well. When you're, you know, looking at social media, you know, TikTok, all the short form content, it's so convenient to just hop on and see, you know, uh, you know, Italy on your phone right away. You see it in bright 4K, right? And then you kind of feel like you don't have to actually go there. But then if you constantly do this, you start to realize, oh shit, I am getting into a creative block and I'm not actually experiencing new real things and real dopamine. Um, and, you know, you can get really caught up into not actually traveling and stuff like that, which is the most valuable thing in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think there is a there's a thread I read in this, but the three most important decisions you make in life is where you live, what you do, who you end up with. Yeah. And that's it. So, cuz even like what you said every single day, you just make one good decision. There the 80/20 rule, which is like, you know, what is the, what's the 80 what's the 20% that's going to drive your 80% of results, mm -hmm. right? And I thought about this for decision making because for me, the number one thing is I, the number one thing for me when I wake up every day is I protect my energy and make sure that my brain is a hundred percent because same thing, we're at the same point where I think this, our decisions are going to make or break yeah. where we get to in business. And tons of people are trying to contact you, right? Like so many text messages, Slack, all these things. And you might not think it's deteriorating your mind, but it's taking way too much brain space. Um, have you ever watched the movie Focus? No. Yeah. So this movie is about priming, um, right? And it's it's show it's Will Smith, Margot Robbie. It's a it's a great movie. You got to watch it. But it basically shows how these thieves prime their you know their prey to thinking certain ways, and then they s steal from them without even knowing. So um, obviously, not the stealing is that's not the lesson that you want to learn from. 
But the lesson here is like everything is priming, right? Just like you're marketing your company, you're marketing to other people, you're priming your consumers. You are also the consumer of your own life. So you need to prime yourself, right? And, you know, there's obviously like people say you got to manifest, tell yourself you're the best in the mirror, you know, go sit in a Ferrari, all that kind of stuff. That's like really obvious manifesting. But then there's also subconscious priming as well that a lot of people just don't think of, right? You need to wake up happy. You know, you need to wake up and not be walking through a filthy room right out, the big, right out the gates, right? You need to, you know, if you turn on the TV, you can't be watching something about, you know, somebody dying, right? Because that's going to instantly just decrease your mood just a tiny bit without even noticing. But, you know, all of these tiny little points will eventually, you know, add up till the end of the day where you actually weren't that productive because your mood was worse than it should have been, right? So it's all priming. And you know what's crazy is the news and media and what's on TV is all meant for that. It's all dopamine spikes. Yep. It's all stuff that's going to get your attention, even though it might not be good for your your mental headspace. And what it does, it, it creates a lot of people in these loops. Exactly. Right? You, you wake up every single day. If you're watching this, you might even feel this way. You feel like you're stuck in this, like, you're playing the same day over and over again. And you're aware, you're awake, but you don't know how to snap out of it. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's the whole world right there. Yeah. Right? BlackRock, all of these huge companies that own, you know, equity in most of the world, right? They're more powerful than the government. All of these people, people don't realize they can literally just switch a chemical in a certain food and instantly just control the way people think, you know, chemicals, people don't realize drug is a chemical, right? You eat a certain thing. It's scary. You could think a certain way, right? So it's all just like, you know, you got to be very careful of the environment you're in. You'll be very careful of what you consume because it will just, you know, put you in the wrong direction. There was, what was this thing I saw recently? There's a TikTok, I believe. Basically, it, it was on the propaganda of breakfast isn't real. And it was yeah. basically sometime a few decades ago, whenever it was, the, the big owners of these breakfast companies selling sausages, eggs, waffles, you name it, there were just no sales. And they had to figure out how to yeah. make, how to increase sales. And so they basically had a huge marketing campaign that basically told everyone breakfast was the healthiest meal today to start. And I still hear this every day, but it's, it's interesting kind of like the behind the scenes of, of what goes on in today's world. And I, I wrote, I wrote on this topic today, but it's rules. The rules you're abiding by today were created by someone sometime earlier in the past, who's no smarter than you. They just create that rule. And now you're kind of living in this box that they created. Exactly. And it might be based off of a reason that you don't even believe it. Right? Yeah. It's crazy. So question everything. You got a question? Question everything. everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for you, what's, uh, I know right now you're, you're, you're thinking about where to, to move to next. What's, what's going through your mind in terms of environment? Cause I guess that's one of the big three decisions in terms of, you know, What's uh, I well I I believe environment's a big dictator in terms oh, of huge of where you'll be, success wise, even who you end up meeting, etc. So I guess what's going through your mind in terms of where to live, live next? Yeah, so I'm kind of trying to scout out where I want to end up. I really don't know. Um, I know there's a lot of beautiful places all around the world, um, but where I come from, I'm Canadian. If people don't know, um, I grew up in a small town known Cam uh, called Kamloops. Uh, nobody really knows about this kind of a shithole, but I love it. Um, and when I made that switch to really go all in on business, I moved to Vancouver and I moved there, you know, with no money and all this kind of stuff because I knew how valuable it was being around, you know, higher net worth indiv individuals. You know, there's supercars everywhere. Vancouver is one of the uh, biggest supercar capitals of the world, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, you know, you go for a bike ride or a walk. I didn't have money to drive my own car and burn gas back then. So I'd walk down the street, Ferrari dealership, Rolls Royce dealership. You know, there's people dressed up well, represent themselves well. Like I'm just studying these people. Um, what do they do that I don't? All that kind of stuff. 
So it was a big milestone for my first years of entrepreneurship. Um, but now, especially after the pandemic and stuff, after living there for four years, I'm kind of, you know, I've, I know every single corner of that city. Um, and in my opinion, it's starting to um, kind of get a little bit more quiet. And um, it's really, it really doesn't have the weather that I like as well. It rains a lot when it's not summer. So I need to be somewhere that, um, you know, a lot of vitamin D, you know, a lot of successful people, um, it's clean, you know, something that doesn't crowd my space with uh, negative stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, Miami is great. I know you love it down here. I would definitely consider having a place here. I don't know if I'd live here full time, um, but I mean, I would consider it. I gotta think, I think I gotta go search for more neighborhoods and stuff. I don't know if the whole city life is for me anymore. I've lived in the city for the last four years, so it's kind of, I'm kind of sick of the honking, but yeah, I think I would, like a setup out in, you know, Miami beach or something like that. Um, that's something that looks feasible. I'm going to probably go to LA as well. Check out there. Um, obviously the home base will probably be more in like the United States, North America and stuff like that. Um, but I mean, I'm open to look at Europe. I want to go to Spain. You know, you mentioned some pretty cool places. You had a good experience out there. Yep. Um, but I kind of see myself probably ending up somewhere in North America, just somewhere that, you know, I don't, I can barely speak English, not along Spanish and stuff like that. Right. So, um, I want to make sure I'm in somewhere that I feel comfortable, um, and, um, around good people. And then I want to have also a place that I can kind of bring back to my roots. This is actually something that we're looking at doing. This is kind of more of a content play as well. Um, I can't tell too much about it, but it's more of a lifestyle, uh, kind of push for content. And we're actually building a rent. We're going to build a ranch, um, near like where I grew up for that. Um, I grew up kind of, you know, dirt biking, uh, fishing, you know, doing stuff in the boonies, that kind of stuff. So we're going to kind of show that side of, you know, being a successful entrepreneur and having the money to do the things that we love as well. Very nice. I want to wrap up with some, uh, some quick questions. So one would be for the 18 year old, 22 year old, someone's trying to figure out their, their career and what to do. What's would be your advice for them? So you're probably not going to be able to hang out with, um, you know, millionaires right off the bat, right? A lot of people say, uh, you know, you hang out with, hang out with five millionaires, you're going to be the sixth, right? So I didn't have access to that. So what I can give you for the, you know, the thing that's going to really put you in the right mindset to have the best growth right off the bat is to just make sure all of the content that you consume on the internet is all that kind of content. So only consume people that are successful, only follow people that are successful. If you, obviously you don't want to unfollow everyone on your Instagram, right? That's kind of disrespectful, even though I do it. Um, just unfollow everyone or get a new Insta Instagram account and populate that with only the content that you need to see. And that should already push you to the next level. Great. And what would you say, what excites you most right now in life? Content. I'm very excited for this next push of long form. Um, I guess I can say a little bit. I'm not going to uh, announce names or anything in the show, but we're starting kind of more of like a reality TV show that's, you know, um, I guess the back end that people don't see of the emotion, you know, building these companies. Um, you don't really see, you know, really what goes behind, you know, these Zoom meetings, um, you know, you know, hitting good days, hitting bad days. And then also what we actually do to, um, you know, sustain our lifestyle, you know, where we spend our money, um, and just really show that we're just regular guys doing this. Very nice. Well, appreciate you coming on the show, man, sharing more about you and, and dropping, dropping nuggets for everyone. It was great, man. Um, I'm really excited to see how this turns out. And I hope I, uh, said something that changes someone's life. Absolutely.